Hi, it's Ashley from Sweet Dreams Bake Shop and welcome back to my channel where I make a lot of cake and cookie decorating tutorials as well as give a lot of baking business tips. And I'm sorry but once again I've caught a cold and it's going to take a lot of cuts to do these voiceovers because I'm coughing every few minutes. I'm the type of person that loves to pay for convenience and in my younger days I used to be really really big on scrimping and saving and if I could save a dollar here or there I would do it and if that meant walking a few kilometers just so I wouldn't have to pay a parking fee, I would do it. But as I've gotten older, I've realized saving those few extra dollars really doesn't benefit me as much as if I just paid. But this past Mother's Day was one of those few times where I felt like, you know, maybe going out for the brunch just isn't worth it this year. I think a couple years back, it was maybe like 40 to $50 per person, which still is not cheap by any means, but it was still within reason. But but this year, even going to a buffet that really wasn't all that fancy and didn't have a lot of seafood and all things that are expensive was costing about $75 per person for adults and about $50 per person per kid. And I just knew that my kids would not be able to appreciate it to that degree. And I also felt like I don't think I can eat $75 worth of food or have $75 worth of a good time at this meal. So my sister and I decided this year for our mom, instead of taking her out to this fancy brunch that would have been about $750 for our entire family, we were going to take about half that money and put it into some really good quality food. For all of the desserts and savories that I made, it took me approximately, I want to say, 8 to 10 hours of work, but it was significantly cheaper. And honestly, I had fun doing it. And both Alia and I are trying to save up the very last moments in this kitchen and just do what it is that we normally do, which is make these giant spreads and make something really, really beautiful and memorable. As with most of my baking vlogs that do include macarons, I always prepare the macaron batter first because it's the one thing that does need to rest. The only downside is it does take up a lot of counter space, so I'm really, really taking advantage of the fact that I have a lot of flat counter space right now. And while I was working on that, Alia started working on the sable crust. I know a lot of you have been asking me for this recipe. Unfortunately, it is Alia's recipe, so I'm not sure if I can share it, but I will ask her for perhaps a future video. Simultaneously, she was also working on the sugar cookie dough, which later on in the video you're going to see doesn't quite turn out as it should have. While she was doing that, I continued to work on the macaron batter, and I love that I have finally perfected the oven temperatures that I need for these macarons. You'll know that your oven temperature is correct for macarons when you can make white macarons and they don't brown on you or get too crisp, or they don't get too soggy in the middle. The trick for my oven, and it works both in the gas oven and the electric oven, is to turn my heat down to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I do eight minutes, turn the pan, and then I do another nine minutes. And I was originally told by a macaron master that I should be putting them in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes, and then turning after five minutes. But that always caused my macarons to just brown a little bit too much, and I could never really get a pure, pure color. Now I'm finding by bringing that temperature down to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm able to get a pretty true color to what it is when the batter goes into the oven. One of the biggest things that I learned about baking and cooking is it's not that you can't make that particular thing, it's that you need to make certain changes and not hold on to something that one person says. Baking can be so finicky, so even one little variable change can cause the whole thing to be thrown off. So don't be surprised if you make something in somebody's house and it turns out just perfectly, but then you try to do it at home and it's not working for you. I haven't messed up macarons in a couple years now, and all of them have been pretty perfect with really, really good feet and full shells. But one of the things that I know is going to happen is when I move to my next kitchen in a couple weeks, I'm going to have to do this process all over again where I test out uncolored batches of macarons to make sure that I've got the right temperatures and times. It could even be the same make and model of an oven, and it might not necessarily react the same way just because of how often it has been used. By the way, of course, Alia is filming her stuff at the same time, so if you want to check out a completely different perspective of this entire day, then definitely go and check out her channel, Cake Legend, after this. 
While Alia was cutting out her tart dough, I decided to get started on all of the fillings and I was making mint chocolate ganache, which normally I don't make because mint tends to not be a favorite of people's and when I'm saving and freezing macarons, I need it to be a crowd pleaser that I can just pull out for anyone. However, it was Mother's Day, so of course I was gonna make that because that is my mom's favorite, favorite flavor of all time for desserts. I remember there was a time when the idea of creating four different flavors from one batch of macarons just seemed so daunting and seemed like so much work. And now it's just become commonplace in my practice of whenever I make macarons. There's no point for me in making a batch of like 20 macarons. I always make them in batches of 80 just so that I can have a variety of flavors and so that it looks nice and full on whatever display table I'm making. That was the first pan that came out. As those were baking in the oven, I decided to use up all the leftover egg yolks from the meringue that goes into the macarons, so I decided to make some creme brulee. Fun fact, Alia hates creme brulee. She doesn't like it at all, and I will never understand this because this is my go-to for using up egg yolks. And even though I did make this for the special brunch slash tea that we were having, uh, nobody ended up eating them because there was way too much food. But I have been enjoying them throughout the week. What I do with my creme brulee is I freeze them and then I fire them up and then it's like eating creme brulee ice cream. It is fantastic. 10 out of 10 recommend for the summer. As you can tell from the change in lighting, it has gotten later in the day. So what I like to do with macaron shells is I really like to make sure they're completely cooled off before taking them off of those sill pads. Keeping them on the sill pads and keeping them on the baking sheet really does help to make sure that you're really having a thoroughly cooked bottom on those shells. Nothing is worse than an ooey gooey mess trying to take them off. And if your macaron shells don't come clean off, you have not baked them properly. I left the macaron shells on that wire rack while I started on the sugar cookies and I kind of knew that the sugar cookie dough was a little bit wrong here. It didn't feel quite as robust as it normally does and it seemed to roll out really, really easily, which is usually a telltale sign that there is not enough flour, but I thought maybe Alia just mixed up the dough a little bit more than I usually do. However, when they came out of the oven and I saw them in this giant little mess, I knew that things had gone wrong and she actually measured the flour with a three-quarter cup measure instead of the one cup measure. Uh, I have a few things in my kitchen that no longer have labels on them so that's how that happened but not to worry we do end up fixing it later. I cleaned all of those dishes and after putting the creme brulees in the oven I took them out and let them cool down a bit, covered them with saran wrap and put them in the fridge. These scones also did not turn out at all and I kind of knew from the way that they looked that they wouldn't turn out but it's because I didn't have a scone recipe that I wanted to use and Alia just looked up a random one online and I kind of know that a recipe isn't going to work if you need to start adding or subtracting from the recipe. As you know, Alia is a pastry chef, so she could kind of tell that the scone dough wasn't looking right. So she tried to fix it on the fly, but it didn't quite work out. While she was working on those, I was working on the lemon curd, and this was the last thing that we were going to do for the night because I had worked a full day, she had worked a full day, and we were both pretty tired. I tripled the batch of lemon curd that I was making, so it felt like it took seven years for this to actually thicken up. The next day, Alia remade that sugar cookie dough and it was perfect for our sugar cookies on a stick and it was also time for us to fill all of the macarons too. My macaron masterful teacher taught me never ever ever leave your macarons out and then fill them the next day but I do it all the time and I honestly don't see that big of a difference. I was making four different flavors, so I made classic chocolate ganache, mint chocolate ganache, as I mentioned before, and then I also made strawberry compote and salted caramel. Those are generally the most popular and my most favorite flavors. Alia made a bunch of mini tarts, but we didn't feel like cleaning out those mini tart pans and then re-rolling things out again, so we decided to go with a large tart, and for the large tart, I was gonna go for a different flavor altogether, and I decided to go for lemon meringue because lemon meringue is my sister's absolute favorite, and I already told that story in the short, but I'll tell it again. Uh, my sister is very afraid of fruit, and when she came over, I had already 
fully, fully decorated this entire tart. So she couldn't actually see the insides. So she said, ooh, what kind of tart is that? And my friend Alia, knowing that my sister is not a fan of fruit, said, oh, it's a strawberry tart. And she was joking around. And I said, no, it's not a strawberry tart. It's a lemon meringue tart. But my sister did not hear me. So she went on throughout the entire brunch believing that this was strawberry underneath. So she filled up on all the other foods, even though I explained thoroughly what every single thing was to the entire family, but she purposefully didn't listen to that part because she said that she gets very annoyed when people explain food and their flavors, especially at high tea places. So she only has herself to blame for the fact that she did not get to indulge in that lemon tart when it was really, really nice and fresh. I think she did end up having a small little bite and then she was even more sad because she couldn't eat anymore because she was so full, but she ended up eating some more the next day. However, her husband did have the final piece, which just, you know, just tells me that I got to make her another lemon ring tart someday. While I was working on the lemon meringue tart, Alia continued to work on the sugar cookies, and then I began to fill the mini tarts. And these mini tarts, I, I can't even talk about how much I love them, because no matter what words I say, it's not going to fully articulate how good these are. And I switched up the type of chocolate that I use. And this chocolate, I believe it's called Foley's Dark Chocolate Melting Wafers. And I found them at Save On Foods, which is a local grocery store in Canada. And it's a, usually a very pricey store I find for groceries, so I don't go there that often. But what a difference that chocolate quality makes. The ganache ends up so, so smooth. Alia finished baking up all of those cookies on a stick and then began finishing off those macarons for me by placing them together and dipping them in the appropriate sprinkles and toppings that we needed for each macaron. And I just want to point out, by the way, that Alia just does this out of the goodness of her heart and for the love of baking. She was not going to partake in any of this food whatsoever, but she just loves, she just loves making these videos with me and I'm so grateful. And that means that I am mainly in charge of dishes duty. So I really, really do try to keep a clean kitchen, which I wholeheartedly believe is the key to staying organized and being able to pull off these big things like this in a short amount of time with just two people. Normally, I wouldn't leave the royal icing sugar cookie decorating to last, but it's just the way that things turned out. And I knew because we were making something super, super simple with really only one single layer of frosting, it wouldn't take that long for it to dry and be able to stand up on a stick and be in the vases that I had planned for. By the way, that was my sister cutting onions on the other side of us while we were cookie decorating. And it's really funny because she said, give me a simple job. I'm really not good in the kitchen. Please just give me something super simple to do. So I gave her an onion to chop for the smoked salmon sandwiches. And she was like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Tell me, do you not know how to cut an onion? Or if you do, is cutting an onion a difficult job for you? I mean, either way, she nailed it. A lot of times when my students tell me they can't do things, all you gotta do is equip them with some confidence and they end up pulling through. And that is exactly what my sister did. So after airbrushing all of these, which just gives it that little nice pop of color, I put a little bit of royal icing in the center and then covered it with some sanding sugar. If you ever want your cookies to have that kind of bright sparkly look with a nice crunch, but you don't want it to be too chunky, go for sanding sugar quality sprinkles. That that's what's going to give you that really beautiful look. After the chocolate ganache tarts set in the fridge, I decided to add on the whipped cream. I just whipped this up to really, really stiff peaks. I don't add any stabilizer whatsoever. This probably also works because of where I live. It's not too warm, so it's nice and cool enough that the whipped cream really does keep its shape. I made two different varieties, so I made just regular chocolate and put some chocolate shavings on top with a little hint of gold leaf, and then I also made an espresso version. And I didn't change the ganache underneath. I found that just adding the espresso powder to the whipped cream really did change the entire flavor profile of the tart. And adding on that chocolate covered coffee bean really sealed the deal. My sister was actually hosting this entire brunch slash dinner slash tea, so we had to move all of the stuff over to her house, but luckily her house is about a five minute walk away, so that was super, super simple to do. 
This edible green moss, by the way, was made using the failed sugar cookie dough that we had earlier. We just baked it off and then we dyed it green, pulverized it in a food processor, and it just makes for a really great stable base inside of that base to hold up those cookies. The key to putting this all together is to make sure that everything is really nice and tightly packed in so it doesn't look too sparse. I really wanted the table to look nice and full without using the traditional tiers and levels that I normally do. I decided to keep everything fairly flat with a few pieces of height in there. I really liked what Ollie and I had created for our New Year's Eve party, so I was trying to recreate that but in a less dark glam way and in a more garden party way. Spoiler alert, the 10 of us did not finish all of this food. However, we had leftovers for a few days and I really enjoyed being able to have these things for lunch. The prawn eggs benedict were probably the biggest hit. I love making homemade hollandaise sauce. It makes all of the difference. And a lot of the savories did get eaten up and we saved a bunch of the desserts. Some of them are still in my freezer. And a little sad story, when we were packing things away, my husband accidentally broke a bunch of macarons, but have no fear. I'm going to show you what I do with those to save them and to still enjoy them in that broken state. I hope you guys enjoyed one of the last baking vlogs in this kitchen. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you can be part of the Sweetie Fam. Right now, I'm uploading weekly, so make sure you hit that notification bell so you know when I upload. Also, be sure to comment, request, or ask a question. I love hearing from you guys. And if you're missing the Bake Down podcast, do not worry. We will be filming more episodes. I just have to make my big move first. Bye!